For every historical event, there is a wealth of conspiracy theories. Even the ancient world is fair game, with many people believing that the great monuments and wonders were built by space aliens instead of our ancient ancestors. But some of the most intriguing conspiracy theories concern the lives of ancient people who changed the course of history. Although we know that Julius Caesar was assassinated in the Senate by those who feared he would become a dictator, there are some people who believe that Caesar passively allowed the assassination to take place. In a 2003 article for the Sunday Times Magazine, historian Richard Gerling supported that theory. He suggested that Caesar was suffering from depression because he had terrible seizures caused by temporal lobe epilepsy. In the article, Gerling explained his logic. Caesar is the most glorious personage on earth, able to freely help himself to anything he fancies, from a peeled grape to an entire country. Who in his right mind would put an end to such a life? In searching for the answer, we need to consider both Caesar's age, at age 56 he is by contemporary standards an old man, and his state of health. Ancient texts make it clear that Caesar is now suffering grievously from epilepsy. If true, this would help to explain certain irrational actions Caesar took near the end of his life, as well as reports of his fainting fits and diarrhea. Some believe that Caesar had already heard rumors of an assassination attempt, so he decided to accept his fate. He had named his grandnephew Augustus as his successor in a new will, and had dismissed his Praetorian guard on the day of the assassination, leaving himself undefended. By allowing the senators to kill him, Caesar would have avoided a long, agonizing, and humiliating decline while securing his place in history as a martyr and victim of great betrayal. We have already discussed the theory that Jesus Christ was a corruption or work of propaganda based on the life and times of Julius Caesar. Some say it wasn't Caesar who became Christ, but rather his son Caesarion, born by the Egyptian queen Cleopatra. Caesarion was born in 47 BC and was known as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Plutarch said that Caesarion was sent by his mother to India via Ethiopia with a load of treasure, but returned on the advice of a tutor and was killed by Augustus Caesar. This theory states that the name Jesus actually means son of Isis, reflecting the idea that Cleopatra was the divine reincarnation of the Egyptian goddess. The three wise men were foreign ambassadors visiting the coronation of Caesarion as Pharaoh in 44 BC, and the star over Bethlehem was actually a famous comet known as the Cydus Ilium, or the Julian star, or Caesaris Astrum, star of Caesar. Caesarion was taught the healing practices of the Egyptian mystery schools by his mother. He successfully fled to India, the home of two other incarnate gods, Lord Krishna and the Buddha, where he learned the secrets of Eastern mysticism. He was assisted by a Hebrew tin merchant named Joseph of Arimathea and his royal cousin Mary. In India, Caesarion became known as Saint Isa and eventually died in Kashmir. The legend of Jesus Christ has created ex post facto based on the spiritual achievements of Caesarion, who possessed a bloodline that combined the royalty of Rome, Egypt, and Israel. The theory further states that Caesarion, and by extension Jesus Christ, was a reincarnation of Alexander the Great through the Macedonian bloodline of the Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt, whose founder was known as Soter, or Savior. Alexander laid the foundations for the rise of Christianity by spreading Hellenism throughout the Middle East. Alexander died at 33, the age traditionally ascribed to Jesus at his crucifixion. Somewhat paradoxically, the theory also says that the suffering endured by Jesus was part of a karmic debt for the military conquests of Alexander. In 451, the Huns were faced with an unlikely alliance between the Imperial Roman Army 
and the Goths, who had established an autonomous kingdom in Aquitaine despite Roman protests. But the threat of Attila had prompted Roman Emperor Valentinian III to ally with the Goths despite their differences. The opposing armies met at the Catalanian plains, fighting fiercely for control of a ridge. The Romans under General Aetius pushed the Huns back. However, Gothic King Theodoric died in combat, and his son Thorismund was nearly captured. Fighting stopped at nightfall. The Huns surrounded themselves with wagons, and Attila ordered a funeral pyre of blazing saddles so that the overlord of so many people should not be taken by his enemies. The next day, however, the Romans and Goths simply blockaded the Hun camp. The day after that, both sides retreated. But 7th century Burgundian historian Fredegar smelled a rat. He claimed that the battle was carefully manipulated by Aetius, who feared a strong, victorious Gothic kingdom was much of a threat to the Romans as the Hun invaders. Fredegar alleged that the night after the battle, Aetius secretly sneaked into the Attila camp, told him about the inbound Gothic reinforcements, and promised to get them to withdraw in exchange for 10,000 solidi, or Roman gold coins. Then Aetius supposedly went to Thorismund and promised to persuade Attila to withdraw in exchange for 10,000 solidi, advising the young king to return to Toulouse and consolidate his rule. The anticlimactic end to the battle meant that neither the Huns nor the Goths achieved an overwhelming victory. Both were out of the Romans' hair for a while, and Aetius had made himself a cool 10,000 solidi. It has long been believed that Alexander the Great and his mother, Olympia, conspired to kill Alexander's father, Philip II of Macedonia. This seemed especially likely as Philip's assassination was executed on the spot without having a chance to explain why he did it or for whom he was working. Alexander's own death in Babylon in 323 BC after a drinking bout has also proved to be ample grist for the conspiracy mill. Many historians believe that Alexander the Great was poisoned with strychnine on the orders of Macedonian regent Antipater. Alexander's mother had warned him of Antipater's ambition, so Alexander summoned the regent to Babylon to be stripped of his rank and possibly executed. Horrified by Alexander's self-defecation, Antipater supposedly plotted to murder the conqueror with the help of poison provided by Aristotle, whose nephew had been killed by Alexander. Aristotle knew how to prepare strychnine, which had a bitter taste that was best masked by undiluted wine. The poison was supposedly hidden in the hoof of a mule ridden by Antipater's son Cassander and administered to Alexander by a disgruntled general tired of his tyrannical rule. In ancient chronicles, the conspiracy theory was slightly more colorful. Antipater sent his son to collect toxic water from the legendary river Styx. Then he kept the water in the mule's hoof because it would eat through any material other than animal horn. One modern researcher has even theorized that the northern Peloponnese River, believed by the Greeks to be the Styx, now known as Mavroneri, had limestones containing the lethal bacterium Calichiomycin, which can cause high fever and death. A collaboration between New Zealand toxicologist Leo Shep and Scotland Yard detective John Grieve produced the theory that Alexander the Great was actually killed by powdered hellebore root, which was used medicinally but could be fatal in large doses. If true, then Alexander wasn't assassinated, but instead accidentally killed by overprescribing doctors. According to historian Richard Stoneman in an interview in History Today, it's not a bad theory. Hellebore, despite its dangers, was the favorite prescription of many ancient doctors because of its violent purgative effects, he said. But it was easy to get the dose wrong, and Alexander's doctors might have had access to an unfamiliar strain of the drug in Babylon, or even misread the Babylonian label. As the legendary temple of King Solomon is important in Judaism, Christianity, and Freemasonry, 
It has been a central element in many conspiracy theories. Early Masonic writers believed that their order was established at the building of the Temple of Solomon. King Solomon, King Hiram of Tyre, and master craftsman Hiram Abif would have been the first grandmasters. These writers also believed that Freemason orders, symbolic decrees, and initiation rituals were first developed at the temple and passed down through centuries to the modern Freemasons with little change. Modern Masonic writers don't take it so literally but insist that symbolism has spiritual importance. According to the entry for Temple of Solomon in the Masonic Dictionary, each lodge is and must be a symbol of the Jewish temple, each master in the chair representing the Jewish king, and every Freemason a personation of the Jewish workman. Anti-Masonic writers interpret things differently. Some say that Solomon, Hiram, and Hiram Abif were occultists, each possessing a single syllable of a sacred and powerful word of God that they used in a ritual when the temple was finished. The actual word is said to have been lost because Abif was murdered before the completion of the temple. According to a conspiracy theorist, Amitak Stanford, two of the syllables are Kir and Wa, but the third is unknown and cannot be discovered. This is fortunate, as he claims the word can summon the power of darkness associated with the Anunnaki elite and the Demiurge. Some Christian conspiracists claimed that Jesus destroyed the Temple of Solomon and annulled the authority of the Levitical priests who lived there. So the connection between Freemasonry and the Temple is evidence of occult chicanery and anachronistic devotion to the First Covenant of the Old Testament. Supposedly, the modern Masons seek to rebuild the Temple, removing the Islamic Dome of the Rock currently standing in its place to serve as a seat for the Antichrist. To accomplish this, the Freemasons and the Illuminati are supposedly manipulating events in the Middle East to lead to a catastrophic war, clearing the ground for a new construction project and a satanic, illuminated Christ figure. Meanwhile, author Philip Gardner has argued that Solomon's temple never actually existed, but was a metaphor and religious symbol instead. He asserts that the technology to create stone buildings of such magnificence did not exist at the time.